Have you heard that using plastic can harm your health? And what the heck are endocrine disruptors and why are they everywhere? I'm Dr. Mona Amin, a board-certified pediatrician and mom, and we're going to discuss endocrine disruptors, where the evidence currently stands on their health risks, and how to proceed for our families without losing sleep. Let's get to it. Endocrine disruptors are natural or synthetic substances that, well, as the phrase says, may disrupt normal endocrine processes. More to come on this. Many of these chemicals are common in the environment or used as plasticizers, preservatives, or lubricants in commonly used products such as household plastics, food storage containers, clothing, cosmetics, medical supplies, and pesticides. Children are exposed to these items via ingestion, inhalation, and dermal or skin absorption. EDCs exist naturally in soy, legumes, and other plant-based products, but they are also found in the air and water, other food sources, personal care products, and manufactured products. The reality is they can be everywhere, and this can feel scary and overwhelming, especially as research comes out. But stay tuned on some practical and balanced ways to approach EDC products. Some common EDCs are listed in this chart. Especially pertinent ones to children include lead, which can be found in paint in older homes, older toys or jewelry and contaminated soil, BPA, which was once used to make polycarbonate plastics and can be found in water bottles, old baby bottles, food packaging, plastic Tupperware, and toys. Parabens and phthalates, which are used as liquid plasticizers and can be found in food packaging, cosmetics, fragrances, and children's toys. Tea tree oil and lavender oil, which is used in skincare products, can also be a risk to children. Soy-based products that contain phytoestrogens, which are chemicals produced by plants that mimic estrogen, and oxybenzone in some sunscreens. Over a thousand individual EDCs have been identified, and if you want a complete list, you can find one online at the Endocrine Disruptor Exchange. My advice is that the list can be overwhelming, so watch till the end on practical big picture approaches to reduce risk and not lose sleep over endocrine disruptors. EDCs are chemicals or mixtures of chemicals that disrupt the way the body's hormones work. Some mimic hormones in our body and some block hormones from doing what they're supposed to do. Others affect how some hormones are made, broken down, or stored in our body, thereby increasing or decreasing those hormone levels. Finally, some endocrine disruptors have the ability to change how sensitive our endocrine system is to different hormones. All of these changes can impact a body's health as hormones regulate your body's healthy development and function throughout life but they can be particularly impactful when exposure is high in utero or during infancy and early childhood. Now, before jumping into potential health risks, I want to emphasize that research is still ongoing. Many studies have shown high levels of exposure, increasing risk of certain diseases, but there's less evidence on where the actual safe levels lie for people across the board. And many recommendations and changes have already been made to reduce the likelihood of exposure to EDCs through common household products, like testing older homes for lead and banning the use of BPA in baby bottles and children's spill-proof cups. I'm going to cover where the research currently stands, but as more studies are done, we'll get a better understanding of risk and be able to make more recommendations. Research has shown that EDCs can cross the placenta during pregnancy and affect the health of a fetus. For example, higher levels of EDCs found in the placenta have been noted to increase risk for fetal growth restriction, low birth weight, thyroid dysfunction, and neurological disorders. Outside of infancy, EDCs can lead to early puberty or precocious puberty. This is when children present with signs of secondary sexual development younger than the age of 8 years in girls or 9 years in boys. Also, exposure to DES and BPA has later in life been associated with human female reproductive malformations, as well as certain types of masses and cancers in reproductive tissues, and is a known risk factor for infertility among men and women. In men, exposures to DDT-containing pesticides and the plasticizer BPA has been noted to cause decreases in sperm quality, and exposures to other EDCs have been found to increase a male's risk for testicular cancer and prostate cancer. Gynecomastia, or abnormal breast tissue growth in boys, has been attributed to excess estrogen exposure from creams, ointments, and sprays, and foods with excessive hormones, like soy. Lavender or tea tree oil have been associated with the development of gynecomastia in prepubertal males and premature breast development, or THELARC, in young girls. Finally, exposure to BPA and phthalates has been associated with a greater incidence of obesity and insulin resistance. BPA is also strongly linked to the development of cardiovascular diseases, including hypertension, in children and adults. So as you can see, 
Research is really important, and this is important information for not only your children, but for you as well so that we can reduce the risk of endocrine disruptors. As mentioned, many EDCs occur naturally in the environment, and we are all exposed to them at some level. Like many things health-related, it's important to respect the research and what we know, and make mindful choices to reduce the risk, respecting that we cannot completely eliminate the use and exposure of EDCs. It's important to lower our risk and remember that the dose makes the issue, so over-consuming, overusing, and the compounded layering of that is when issues are likely to occur. What I don't want is fear and losing sleep over chemical overload. Yes, we should take an umbrella approach for risk reduction, but you don't have to live in fear of the world. Recently, on social media, I remember seeing a post go viral spreading fear about thermal receipt paper at grocery stores, saying that you should not touch it. Yes, they can have BPA, but touching a receipt once every so often is not going to harm you. Employees can wear gloves due to repetitive touching, but hand washing helps, and unless you're eating the receipts and rubbing it on your skin, I'm not worried that you're going to overconsume. Let's discuss some practical tips and how I also navigate this, not only as a pediatrician, but also as a mom who cares about the health of her children and her patients. Remember, you don't need to do all of these things, but you get to decide what's reasonable and worth it to you. Reduce the use of plastic for food storage and cooking. Plastic can contain EDC such as BPA and phthalates that can leach into food and beverages. Swap out plastic bags for paper or reusable BPA-free bags that you can wash. If you do use plastic, avoid heating food or liquid in them and look for products labeled BPA-free. We use glass containers for food storage and BPA-free plastic containers. Always look for BPA-free products and try not to warm food or liquids in plastic directly. For utensils and eating, think silicone or stainless steel. Pick reusable BPA-free water bottles over disposable plastic bottles. Thoroughly wash fruit and vegetables before consuming them, or for more thorough pesticide removal, you can peel produce or soak it for 15 minutes in a baking soda water solution. I personally am okay with thorough washing and not a deep soak and peel. Use infant bottles and toys labeled BPA-free. Polypropylene, a microplastic found in baby bottles, is not known to be an endocrine disruptor. But if you are concerned about warming milk in baby bottles, you can warm them and then transfer or use a glass bottle. Again, this is your choice based on what you feel is best. We happily use BPA-free baby bottles for both of our children. We never place them in the microwave, but we did sometimes warm the milk up by placing it in a warm mug of water. Again, this comes down to overconsumption. You have to look at what areas are sustainable to reduce risk and go with that. When it comes to soy, it is hard to know how much soy is too much. We do know there is a link between excessive soy use and gynecomastia in boys and early breast development in girls. But with this is moderation. This means if soy is part of your diet, great. But if it's the only thing you're eating or your child consumes three, four, five cups of soy milk a day, Think about cutting back. Choose a mineral-based sunscreen. This is because there is concern that chemical sunscreens may contain the EDC's oxybenzone, which can be absorbed through the skin and have been linked to concern for hormone disruption. Again, research is ongoing, so this is reducing risk while we wait for more research. Mineral sunscreen, typically made of zinc oxide or titanium dioxide, has been studied and classified as safe and effective by the FDA. If you are using sunscreen often, minimizing the use of chemical sunscreens can help reduce our risk. We use mineral-based sunscreen for our kids and we have chemical sunscreen for myself and my husband. Occasionally, we do use this for our son, but that's if we didn't grab the different kind and we're not panicking because it's not constant use. So you have to look at what is affordable, what you can do, again, reducing your risk. Read labels on personal care products and look for products labeled phthalate-free, BPA-free, paraben-free. Most child care products in the United States should be free of these, but be careful when purchasing items online from other countries. They should also have this indication as well. Avoid the use of topical formations of tea tree and lavender oils in infants, children, and adolescents. These can contain chemicals with hormonal properties and repeated use of these oils have been linked to breast growth in prepubertal boys and girls. If it's a one-off here and there, that's fine. But if you're using these products every day, it could lead to endocrine disruption with the research and clinical experience we currently have. So we wanna do our best to reduce that risk. Use fragrance-free skincare products so there are less chemicals and potential for disruptors and also skin irritation. Avoid hand-me-down plastic toys, particularly if they're very old as this can lose integrity and leak more endocrine disruptors. Make sure there is no lead risk in the house like peeling paint or old furniture that a child can pick and ingest. 
Taking this a step further would be to remove flame retardant items from the home, but this can be pricey. And so like I mentioned, it's about you thinking what is best for your family, your resources, your income. We personally didn't get rid of flame retardant items, but others may. So we've chose other areas to reduce our risk. Again, don't stress about every unwashed berry your child eats, touches, or plastic water bottles that they drink out of, but instead look at the overall picture of reducing repetitive risk as much as you can. This is what I do. If a story comes out about another endocrine disruptor, I look at our life as a totality. Are there areas that we can cut back? Is that financially possible or reasonable? I ask you to do the same. The fear of chemicals and the stress of overthinking about that can sometimes be worse for our health than the actual chemical. So look at the big picture and what you can do to reduce and not eliminate risk. For more information on this topic, check out the description box below where I link some great resources. Has your family implemented any of these strategies already? Leave any questions or comments below. And if you found this information helpful, please like and share this video and make sure to subscribe to be the first to know about new videos published. I'll see you all next time for another video here on Pete's Doc Talk TV. Stay well.